with the TV first. But <laughs> you tell me when. Uh, so it will come into the, this kind of thing. In a few minutes, the TV will be on. And I need to, just to warn a number of people. So for those of you who are uh, plugged on TV now, just wait another 15 minutes and the uh, Lone Vigors, the great, great Lone Vigors, will be here on stage. But before, before I need to introduce you to someone else, and, and you still have time to relax and breathe, everything is going fine. And you know what? We have been shifting progressively during the day, from yesterday, about daylight bringing health, comfort, having some uh, good structure, also mathematical structure, and progressively we will move towards well-being and very soon happiness. So, so your time will come. But before, I would like to introduce you to someone who has showed great flexibility this morning, that is Werner, my good friend Werner now, who has been succeeding to replace the, this poor old uh, John who, was, who has tried to join Europe, but it was really too hard for him to... to, to <laughs> sustain that. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> but, but Werner is not, is not only a, a great moderator, as you have seen, he's also an architect and a professor. So, so he accumulates everything. He has all qualities. So Werner, with all your passion about uh, design, daylight, the floor is yours, and we are waiting to, to hear more about uh, yeah, well-being thanks to daylight. Thanks, uh, Werner. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Actually, today I'm talking a little bit about daylight craft and reclaiming a culture of carefully crafting architectural details and going after James Carpenter. The name is the program in his case. He is the carpenter, the craftsman of architectural detail. And we're looking at this a little bit. And many times when I look at buildings, I think, OK, have we lost something in this over the last couple of decades? Many of the things uh, have missed their rich and expressive languages, the surroundings of buildings become less articulated, and the daylight openings um, are appearing more without detail, just flat things in a flat wall. And we would like to go back to an architecture that really works with the level of detail. Right now, it seems to be driven by construction time and cost. So if we look at some window details here, some examples from Aarhus, where we just have very odd things uh, with a, a window that just opens onto an edge of a wall and can't be opened further, uh, windows that uh, fit into the frame and there's a gap and then they just put some caulking in there. It's not very pleasant to look at this. Sometimes the windows are hidden behind the column and while this is opening outside, you can see half of the frame and in other cases, the frame is behind the wall in the corner there. Um, while there's a good amount of daylight in there, we could do a lot better than that. So the objective of this little presentation is to look at some examples, particular historical ones, and the interaction between daylight, sunlight, ventilation, energy use, and by comparing some ideas that we've seen to rediscover this joy of architecture and the functional vernacular design language that we could really use uh, with this. And this is a little house that I photographed on a summer holiday down in Monton in southern France, where you see how the windows are used. Um, similar structure, we have the shading devices in there that open to allow for ventilation, but still blocking the sun. You can open different parts of the window to go out onto a balcony or just to step towards the window and enjoy your environment. So this kind of thing comes in very different cultures. Here we have a Mashrabiya example uh, from Egypt uh, in Cairo, where you see a very closed facade from the outside providing the privacy for people inside. But when you're inside the space, it's actually quite well lit, and you get a sense of what's happening outside on the street. So I'm going back to my hero, uh, Lisa Hashong, who has written the book on thermal delight in architecture. And while standards might suggest a fairly uniform illuminance across the work surface, varying light levels and darkness are very important for us. And it's the same way with the uh, thermal environment. So while we rely for 80% on visual information that provides sensual clue, the thermal delight that Lisa describes in her book talks about sensuality, cultural role, and symbolism, and like 
fire light can then be an animating spirit of the body of our buildings. Here's a little example from John Parson in a very simple converted stable that used to be housing sheep. And now it is a guest house for a monastery where he has deliberately used careful materials that are in keeping with the old character of the building, separated daylight and ventilation by providing separate openings for them and allowing the user of the space to sit in the window looking outside, experience the different qualities of the uh, light environment outside. And if you look at the building from the outside, it has been remodeled from the original stable, added insulation to make it more comfortable, but the interior spaces are really a delight. So when we're talking about daylighting, we're talking about the practicing skill of placing windows and openings or reflective surfaces so that the day natural light provides effective internal lighting. And when we talk about sustainability, in my view, we look at something that it sustains itself for a long period. So sustainable daylighting really contributes to enduring architecture and really ties these things together. And daylight craft then is employing a highly developed design skill with careful attention to detail, following some well-established design processes in which we document very clearly what the design decisions and the rationale for that is by simulation, by models, by other ways of doing that. And here's an example from Australia, Glenn Merkert, a well-known sustainable architect. He has designed very effectively with the climate by providing delightful spaces, in this case, uh, an education center which has various rooms that people stay in while they're attending courses there. And you see the facade treatment on the south facade being very carefully articulated. So you can open and close different parts of the facade. You have fins sticking out, cutting out some of the lower sun angles early in the morning, late in the afternoon to keep the temperature inside comfortable and allowing for natural ventilation through the openings that you can actually provide. Alva Alto, another one of my favorite architects, in this case in Wolfsburg, which I have visited with students, um, where he has used a lecture hall, very carefully crafted with daylight. Also ventilation, you see in the skylight some ventilation openings there. You see carefully crafted wood elements that help with the absorption of the sound. And the lecture part can be used for a speaker standing there without a screen used behind it with the presentation. But if you do need the screen, you can just close the top and have a darker environment. So the screen brightness is acceptable for this. Julia Morgan, an architect working in the arts and crafts movement in California, while very dark wood materials, she has also created very delightful spaces by deliberately putting windows in positions that provide a nice view. And I want to categorize this as a little design procedure for daylighting, which I call the 4I method, inspiration, initiation, integration, and implementation. And in the inspiration, we explore the older buildings and we look at the climate and the context in which they are presented and note how they treat the surroundings and observe the daylight openings that frame the views. So here are some examples from Denmark uh, that has very careful the skill of the craftspeople represented in the window of that building. So you know what's happening inside the building. And the other one almost has my name spelled out there um, if you move the letters around a little bit um, and the windows opening uh, to the outside. In Gamle Bu, a little open air museum in Aarhus, Aarhus is currently the cultural capital of Europe, we have this delightful window where you see during the daytime, you open up the shutters and they fold into the column. And at nighttime, when you close them off to get privacy or maybe for uh, thermal insulation, you fold them into the window. And those are the kind of details I'm talking to that can really enrich our architectural language. Alva Alto in Wolfsburg again did something similar by separating also the window from the ventilation opening. And in old Danish churches, you're working with very thick walls and splayed reveals that allow 
daylight to come in in a very soft way while you're sitting there. You don't uh, perceive glare. You have the light filtered through these deep reveals into the space. Pantheon, a very famous example that allows direct sunlight into non-critical areas, but where you're sitting, you have a good daylighting. Somebody was saying it smells in there. Uh, it also has an opening in the top where rain comes inside, so in the occasions where it does, and the uh, floor is actually curved, so the rain comes into the center and then flows to the sides. So very clever design that they have there. Initiation is then to take some of these examples and examine this genius loci, the sense of place, and work with an interdisciplinary team of design experts looking at design options and locating, sizing, shaping daylight op uh, no, openings sorry, in relation to the needs of people inside and assess those performance. Um, Arne Jakobsen, one of the famous Danish architects, um, looked at uh, various schools, and this is one of the example schools that has been modified recently by adding additional spaces to it. But you see the treatment of the light, and that still works reasonably well. We need to integrate the different needs that we have and select the most promising design details. Consider differentiating daylighting and solar shading, particularly in relation to facade orientation and the climate conditions that are important in this context. We develop architectural expression and construction details in a very well integrated system. And again, going back to Glen Merkert, here in Australia, in Aboriginal country, Northwest, uh, Northern Territories, at a latitude uh, closer to the equator, he has looked again at the building and the traditional culture. Aboriginal cultures typically don't have any buildings. They have shelters made from bark uh, cut of trees. But he fabricated this. He took three years on site sitting there observing, observing their culture and then looking at the different sun angles and treating the different facades, opening up the facades to allow the moisture be uh, drawn out of the building and allowing activities to happen. And if the wind really becomes too strong, which also happens in that area, you can close the whole facade and still be protected. And your own private belongings might be hidden away uh, while the building is open through most of the day. This example I came across on a field trip with my students to Istanbul. Where this is the only high-rise building that I know where they've really looked at the facade and said, OK, this is the southwest east facade, and we're having shading devices. We don't have that on the other facades in the other direction. We rarely see that. I'm not saying this is beautiful architecture necessarily, but it's attempting to make use of that climate information. And we need to look at some of these things and sketch the details. And Claude was showing some very nice examples earlier in her little drawings, understanding this. And Dean has shown this in his own building, how you worked it out. So when we implement this, we're making use of these intricacies, a complex nature of the sun's properties. We're preparing these highly detailed and specific construction documents so that the craftsperson that puts all these things in place can look at the drawings that we produce and say, yes, this is how we can do it. And the materials work together. We don't have gaps uh, that we just plaster over and then that crack in, in no time and make it very unsightly. And then, of course, we need to check what's being implemented and calibrate and commission the systems that we have put in there and really look and go back at the building and stay in touch with the users to really understand how they're reacting to the building so we learn something for the next building that we do. Um, some architects are going back to some of these things. This is a building uh, just being completed where we will be doing a daylight measurement program in there uh, to understand um, Sauerbrachen Hatten here in Berlin, the GSW headquarters building, a very narrow building footprint with daylight on both sides and really clever shading devices in this uh, d design. This one we have seen before in Aarhus, um, if you have the opportunity to come to Aarhus, you've seen a few buildings already today that are worthwhile visiting. We are the cultural capital. We're always happy to also uh, host you at our daylighting lab if you would like to, to look around a little bit. Uh, this is something that is part of visual delight. It's not appropriate perhaps for a work environment, but it really contributes to people's experience. John Parson again, framing views very carefully in this house in Japan or in this church in Augsburg in Germany that was 
was renovated uh, using the white walls and the reveals of the windows uh, to really create a very spiritual atmosphere in there. Sauerbrock and Hutton again in the Oval Office in Cologne uh, where the shading devices give a tint to the inside. And I'm not sure whether it's a good or bad thing if you're working, but it certainly adds visual interest and delight to that. And Glenn Merkert again in a house in uh, New South Wales in Australia. So this is a little bit of an inspiration, a short talk. I was asked to actually cut down a little bit so that we come to the end uh, on time. Uh, I would like to thank Sophie, uh, who is my research assistant for the last four years, who has supported me in many, many different ways. If you could just stand up, and she's been contributing author to this presentation as well. And, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Werner, and thank you for having respected the time uh, so well. Great professional. Uh, Attitude and by the way, if you want to continue about inspiration about uh, windows, I can only invite you to come and visit before you go to Aarhus, the cultural capital, and blah blah blah. <laughs> you just go close to uh, close to Copenhagen in a small city which is called Seborg, where you have the most fantastic collection of windows which has been created. It is Maskinvai number four in Seborg. It is called the Willem, uh, the Willem Collection, Willem the Willem Window, and it's, it's a fantastic museum. You have any kind of windows dating from uh, middle age to now, and I can only encourage you to, to pay a visit there. Thank you very much, Werner, again, and uh, we are progressively moving to, I said, to happiness, and as you know, Probably, especially most of you are Danes, so as you know, the Danes are very happy because they have been one of the happiest countries in the world. Now, they have been passed by Norway, but no one's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the, the, the answer about happiness when you hear Lone Vigors, that is because they live in healthy architecture, I'm sure. So Lone Vigors will, will come now, and she's an architect. She has been partners since 1997 in CF Müller, at present, with a staff of about 325 employees, divided between six departments, one in the cultural capital of Europe, which is ours, <laughs> another office in Olborg, another one in Copenhagen, which is part of the happy country of last year, another one in Oslo, which is part of the happy country of this year, another one in Stockholm, which may be a happy country very soon, and, I, and another one in London, because you have to go abroad and beyond Europe sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Lone Vigors has taken part in a large number... Oh, oh, it's not broadcast, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Lone Vigors has taken part in a large number of projects with a broadness ranging from housing, schools, senior institutions, hospital, museum, to planning and design. The projects have been conducted as catching project supervisor and design responsible partner. Furthermore, Lone Vigros has participated in various professional associations as teacher, censor, speaker, chairman. Maybe one day she will be moderator. So please <laughs> welcome Lone Vigros. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, after that introduction. No pressure. <laughs> uh, I certainly hope that if uh, 10 million people are really watching that I don't have anything between my teeth at the moment. And also, uh, I would like to say, Michelle, that you're the kind of charming Frenchman that any girl wants to marry. But right now, I would be filing for a divorce, to be honest. <laughs> I need a chair up here. Do I can just take this. Because there's so much to say, and I hate if the... If the slides are too text heavy, you also probably know, and quite frankly, I'm here to kill you off after a long symposium. So I'm the last uh, bird on the, uh, on the planet, I was gonna say, but so you have to, uh, you, have to um, um, you have to bear with me that I have a lot of paper with me because I can't remember everything I have to say otherwise. So excuse the falling of the papers all the time in advance. Anyway, uh, happy people in healthy architecture. Uh, yes, so I'm Lone Vigas and I come from CF Müller. You just had the introduction and it's a real great honor for me to be here. I really sincerely uh, 
humbly uh, thank the, uh, the organizers for inviting me. And I'm going to talk about the use of evidence-based design for a more healthy architecture. And I would like to say a little bit about the cultural and historical aspects of uh, the use of daylight in architecture. And I'd like to show you a couple of cases of uh, how our office uh, is working with these uh, elements in public buildings especially. So, uh, who are we really? We are a, a modern international architect's uh, office, and our company was founded in 1924 by the uh, uh, professor and architect Christian Frederick Müller, who actually became the first uh, head of uh, the architecture school in Aarhus as well, which also gave birth to uh, C.F. Müller becoming a partnership because he couldn't do everything, so he had to get some partners uh, to help him. He is, he, they started the office with uh, Kai Fisker, whom you probably know, all the Danish uh, architects in the room at least. And uh, that happened in Copenhagen, and uh, it's been this partnership for more than 50 years. And today we are uh, uh, an all-architects ownership of nine people. Uh, you can see them uh, at the picture here. So the company... Um, is, uh, as was mentioned, six offices in four countries and uh, with representation in, in four European capitals. And of these, three are located in Scandinavia. So obviously Scandinavia and Denmark is important for the uh, outset from understanding where we are coming from. The climatic zone of, of Scandinavia, but also the, the design tradition. And our portfolio is uh, consisting uh, of uh, an approximate average of 70 to 30 percent public to private uh, projects. So our comfort zone really lies with the Scandinavian welfare state, I would say. And we actually designed the welfare state. We designed the universities, the schools, the hospitals, the museums, the sports arenas and the research buildings, as well as, of course, housing and offices, and that for more than 90 years. So our staff, we would say, is a multidisciplinary team Obviously, uh, 325 or 40 people is not uh, one office. It's actually about 100 little teams or something in general. They are all shifting uh, position. They are moving in and out with, on, on the platforms of the teams. So they're, uh, they're really uh, merging like that. And obviously, we have a geographical uh, distance, uh, which means that we have to... Um, find ways of collaborating uh, across nations. But we're working not so much out of an architectural style, because that would not work with a hundred little teams, and that's not really interesting, we think. If you know the architect Oscar Niemeyer, you could say that man has one architectural style, which is, by the way, totally beautiful, and I'm in awe. I just went to Brazil and saw it. So, but we don't do that. We, we are working from uh, a proven working method, which is really based on values like uh, quality, innovation, sustainability, of course, simplicity and clarity, honesty, openness, loyalty, and passion, you could say. A couple more, perhaps, but it's a long, it's a long list. So what is it, uh, this working method, really um, consists of uh, an analysis of site, climate, and program uh, from the beginning of uh, every project. And this analysis will inform and inspire an integrated and sustainable functional and aesthetic architecture. So it's an architecture that's integrated with the local context, the genius loci, like we just heard. And it's also adding value to local context. It's important to give more back than you, you start out with. It's also inspired by users, because working for the public, uh, the users have a very democratic say in how they think the buildings should work. So they're actually being included democratically and being asked, how do we uh, design this building uh, the most efficient way for you guys to work in it? So that's an important differentiation between the private and the public uh, architecture. Um, we also try to innovate standards, though we know that it, there's no real realism in innovating everything, but we need to innovate ev every time to actually move, move ourselves, move the world, and just move on uh, to uh, new horizons. So we have to challenge the standards and the norms we meet, and also the perception of the same that we often meet. 
So it's a design which is inspired by evidence of what makes us feel good and thrive as humans. Yeah, since uh, this Scandinavian welfare state was born, there has been a close-knit relationship uh, built between the design sector and the public sector. That's been established because the people paid with taxes for public care and education for all, and in return they asked for good design. So the architects and designers, they were valuable to the evolution of the planning and building of the welfare state. And this relationship was founded on a mutual respect for the profession and a loyalty to the ideal of the common good. So the quality of public design has traditionally been very high in Denmark and in Scandinavia. So you could argue that the common building, uh, the, the, the building quality of society's common buildings, every, it's all our buildings. It actually is so powerful because the welfare state is so important in the Scandinavian societies that it actually rubs off on the private sector as well. And it kind of educates and it impacts the users who's, who are raising their demands and standards of quality. And so when the public sector takes a strong lead and sort of goes ahead in demanding quality of design, pressured by the user, it educates the population again and raises the expectation for quality. So this is a very interesting circle. And I believe personally that that's one of the reasons why uh, the Scandinavian uh, countries have this high design profile because it's the it's a democratic user pressure uh, and expectations of more and more good design. What we're seeing now, unfortunately, is that politically there are no, not the same kind of respect and loyalty to that quality program. There are other issues that are more important, apparently. So this is a challenge that we are we can feel every day when we go to work. So. The aesthetics of the Scandinavian design, what is it really? What does it look like? Well, the designers have sort of, um, um, there has been this priority to function and affordability over preciousness and luxury. But as I write, it's not so cheap to buy. I mean, it's not like it's super affordable, all of it. But it was, it used to be, and it's a good aim anyway. So just to say that that's where it's coming from. Um, Giving form involves, of course, solving any functional, personal, or societal challenge in a simplified way. It's a kind of do more with less approach. And Danish furniture and industrial designer Mess Altgo, you probably know him, he describes this as an urge to take away. So to remove all kind of uh, design clutter in an object. So keep cleansing it down, cleaning it up, cleaning it up, cleaning it up until you reach the perfect, it's a kind of a Zen type of uh, approach to design, which is, I find interesting. So it's not just because we don't have the machine that can make all the doodlulululut, it's because we, we don't think we need the doodlulululut to be happy. <laughs> That's a good explanation, and I hope everyone out there got that <laughs> clearly. Anyway, sorry about that. Okay, so this, uh, there's a kind of quest for simplicity or minimalistic logic uh, of form, aesthetics, and material. And also, this tradition is based on a scarcity of resources. The countries didn't have many natural resources. Uh, and also, it is based on craftsmanship. So it's rooted in the scarcity, scarcity. We had the natural materials such as sand and stone and clay, wood, iron, straw, and even seaweed. Uh, was turned into simple functional uh, objects and buildings. And um, that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, there's a kind of clarity to the design. It's not so over, over, you're not using every uh, architectural, every material in the catalog, you could say. So it's more clean like that. So let's talk about evidence-based design. So evidence, what is that really in architectural terms? Evidence means proof. And uh, to be working evidence-based means that you are critically, systematically, and explicitly ensuring the application of the to-date best knowledge onto a given issue. And you may ask, okay, what is the to-date best knowledge then? Well, that is exactly the research-based knowledge, it could be the experience-based knowledge, or it could be the sense-based knowledge. 
So obviously, there is a route from the extreme, the real research, the real science that a lot of you guys are doing here, scientific meta-analysis, systematic reviews of cohort studies, and so on. And then there's this, it's just, goes, I, I, maybe I should have flipped it up and said it goes up and up and up, it goes down and down and down to actually uh, ending into the intuition. Intuition in interpretation and choice, common sense. Common sense is also part of this. And um, if we move on to talking about the sen senses and, and the sensoric, the evidence from the sensoric universe, you could say that let's, you, the stimulation, uh, we know that stimulation of one or several of our five senses will affect people in, a, in an either positive or negative way. And these uh, sensoric impressions, they're noted in the brain and where they will have a much larger impact than the actual experience itself. So if you use carefully selected architectural enablers, they can have an impact on how we sense our surroundings. I mean, this is also common sense, we all know that, but now we're trying to scientificalize it or whatever. And hereby create a basis for happiness, relaxation and renewed energy. This impression can call, will cause a physically positive effect and fasten the healing process in the case of hospital architecture. And as people, they are different. We are different in our behaviors, but we are the same biology. It will be individual as to how much effect these sensoric impressions will cause. But generally speaking, this impression is in the, the impressions that are associated with nature are the most beneficial and efficient, as our bodies, of course, have evolved. Uh, and adapted to nature and natural habitats throughout uh, generations. And by this logic, we'll find most harmony in association with nature. No surprise. Okay, with sound. The structure of sound is vital to how it's perceived. Um, if it's structured, meaning repeated mechanical sounds, they will be immediately perceived. We can understand them. But they demand a strenuous attention to have a de-stressing effect. Actually, only in meditation you can bear this, the, the, the simple gong, gong. This you can bear if you're concentrating and you're meditating at the same time. If you're not doing that, it quickly, you know, you get fed up with that sound very quickly. So that sort of kills you off very, uh, the same, the funny opposite, of course, is the same, uh, is the thing that about chaotic sounds, because chaotic sounds, that will pass by the conscience more and affect the body positively. That's also why we have this aspect of white noise, and it actually, it actually works uh, as a de-stressor. And rhythms and frequencies of sounds, sort of like the ocean, the waves of the ocean, it also will affect the natural body rhythm. It has to do with the pulse and the breathing of our cells, as well as the frequencies of the cells. And uh, it will affect both our state of mind and our physical healing. So the sounds of nature are particularly helpful and good for us, but they can easily be overpowered uh, if you don't care, if you don't plan carefully by other noise. And have a look at the little red robin Twerking, twerting, twerting, not twerking, that's different. <laughs> Would you like to see that movie, The Little Twerking Red Robin? No. <laughs> what is it? Tweet, tweet, tweeting, tweet, tweeting, the Twitter president. No. Now it's back to the, back to the script. Sorry. <laughs> so we have the, the birds are singing at about 50 decibel, and which is equivalent to a low speech, uh, low speaking, uh, uh, yes, whisper, you could say. So it's very delicate. About water, water is uh, the symbol of life, and it can occur in many forms, which makes it a very good medium, and that can affect man in many ways. So water, of course, covers the globe, two thirds of the planet, and it has a great importance in relation to the human basic body rhythm. We ourselves are 80% uh, water, or plus 80%. So it has a great importance in relation uh, to uh, the sound of water in nature. It often appears calming and de-stressing. 
So the water also has uh, this appealing and alluring effect, and, and it, it particularly is, uh, is efficient when you uh, get it in connection with interaction and touching. And the sound of water, like I just went through, can also be produced artificially. So the fake sounds of water, computer-generated sounds of water, is, however, too homogeneous to feel de-stressing. So you can, every time you have this, the brain is very uh, quickly uh, detects these this kind of mechanicalness, which is uh, completely the opposite effect in the brain, apparently. So, so it's likely that this repeated rhythm of structure will dominate the sound image altogether, and, and the calming effect will therefore disappear. And then, of course, sunlight. I bet you've talked about that today. Um, with water, of course, the sun is the decisive factor of life for the man on planet and life on Earth. And uh, first of all, of course, it brings us the warmth, the light, the energy. And back in history, we've been dependent on sunlight and all the activities that were connected uh, with the solar cyclists. That's the man. Man has activities that are totally um, in, in, in sync with that cyclist. Through time, numerous research has uh, been made on also the beneficial effects, obviously, of daylight. Uh, for example, in 1903, there is a Dr. Finson in Denmark who won the Me Nobel Prize for medicine for his studies and work on, on uh, the healing of tuberculosis patients with ultraviolet light rays and sunlight. And today we know that sunlight, if it's regulated and controlled, it can have an uplifting and positive effect. Uh, and can affect certain treatment processes very positively. So furthermore, the stimulation of, uh, and creation of vitamin D in the skin happens when we're exposed to sunlight. And then there's the interesting evidence that learning is stimulated when exposed to daylight. So students sitting next to the windows will score higher marks than their peers sitting in the deep end of the classroom. So now a couple of parents here will have to go home and talk to their teachers of where their little baby is going to sit. So that's true. OK. In the North, we have a long tradition for worshipping daylight. It, and culturally and historically, it's been a driving force. And we've had a cult-like relation to the sun and the light. A sun, there, we had a sun cult approximately 2,000 years BC in the Bronze Age in North Europe and Scandinavia. And this cult was all about the omnipotent divine movement of the, movement of the sun, worshipped as a symbol of the cycles of life. And for example, we found this sun wagon about 1800 BC, uh, age from it age, age, ages back to that. And it was found in a, in a grave in Denmark somewhere and picturing the sun being pulled over the sky on a wagon by a horse. <laughs> So people, they were holding uh, solar celebrations with lure music and uh, showing off their bronze axes and uh, doing the flick flack dances and in honor of the sun. So the cult was very uh, strong. And to please the sun god, they even had this, uh, uh, they got up every morning and ensure to, to, to sort of please them and ask the sun to get up every morning and ensure the life and survival of the people. They even sacrificed to the sun by bearing gifts and live animals and even later people and tossing them into the lakes and moors in order to ask for a, a, a wishes granted in return. So please get up tomorrow, please get up tomorrow. We'll kill our neighbors to prove that we really mean it. It's a big gift. So, so and this is interesting, by the way, it's just a small side remark, because today we have a leftover of that ancient cult uh, thing, because we are tossing a coin, which is a small gift, into the fountains, the water, to ask for something private has to happen to me, something granted from above. So that's an interesting little thing that actually derives from the Bronze Ages. So... Also, the St. Hans feast we have, it's a celebrating the brightest midsummer night with bonfires along the beaches of Denmark. It's an old pagan fest, uh, origina or pagan fest originally the, the marking of the most uh, light time of year, the summer solstice. And Christmas, obviously, also an original pagan fest to mark the darkest time of our, our year is over and to celebrate the return of the life-giving sunlight. And later in history, up in 1853, the cholera outbreak in the damp uh, and overpopulated uh, uh, parts of Copenhagen inspired the doctors of the time, a, a man called Emil Horneman, to have the Danish version of the English uh, workers' housing in Copenhagen design, known as Bromleby. 
And uh, this was uh, Binnesbühl who designed that. And this was kind of a new doctrine of dry and clean city with daylight and fresh air and separated sanitary facilities that was born and actually became the functional model for uh, workers' housing for more than 50 years after that. And in the beginning of the 19th century, Denmark also joined the modernist movement in architecture, which founded a lot of our current values in building design that we know today, and which also gives priority to function and of affordability over preciousness and luxury. So, and other expressions of that would be form follows function and do more with less. Uh, and the sun cult is still active today because the Danes are really, and the Norwegians and Swedes as well, I'm sure, are rushing out into the parks at the first sight of light, of the sunlight in the, in the spring. It's really quite a remarkable, it's like putting the cattle on grass, you know, once you let the kettles out of the stable, they're like <laughs> going bananas. It's a little bit like that in Kongsheo in Copenhagen every year. Okay, in the north, we have some day, the, 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 the effects of daylight. Uh, it sort of also is, of course, uh, embedded in architecture. And it comes out in, in different ways, and I'm only mentioning some of them here. But the daylight and shadows are defining, of course, uh, and nuancing the space and form of buildings and building components, as well as it also de it defines the use and the functionality of the space. So the architects have always been shaping and molding the spaces, the buildings and the cities, with daylight being it as a puddle of direct sunlight on the floors of the building, the translucent screening off of the light, the dynamics of experiencing daylight inside out, or blending it with artificial light. And uh, the aim today of the architects, of course, is to shape the buildings and cities as such that we can get as much, um, a maximum of daylight into the work and living spaces, based on all the knowledge we know, how beneficial it is, and uh, without gaining the heat. So that's, of course, this uh, contraproductive uh, exercise, which is uh, <laughs> causing a lot of interesting research work. So a modern version of worshipping the daylight is really represented by uh, the use of a lot of transparency, glass, and reflection of light. But we also have some uh, norms and regulations. The building regulations uh, state that all workspaces must have adequate levels of daylight for work. It's a work environmental legislative reason. So 2% daylight factor on working station surfaces. Only temporary workspaces are allowed in places with less daylight. And the buildings must not, mustn't be too close to each other, defined by height restriction laws, of course, for the city, what we in Danish call Heutekanseplaner. So for the offices, the result is that we are having temporary rooms placed in depth, in the depth of the buildings. We are using the borrowed light for that. But the office buildings with large but solar shaded windows, we find that a lot of large but solar shaded windows. We have uh, uh, emerging uh, um, pool of intelligent sensor driven solar shading with the movement of the sun and more north facing openings and atriums and skylights into deep building mass and bodies. And that's really the every day we come to work, we pull up our sleeves and say, OK, that's today. That's today's work. That's what we have to do. All architects and Scandinavia. So when you come to housing, uh, housing in Denmark must have adequate daylight factors in living area. Building regulation states 2% daylight factor in 50% of living room floor plate. So a lot of light into the living room. What we see in the design today is therefore uh, that the ground floor housing, which is lowest in the dense city, have extra ceiling heights so that the light can come in and good ceiling heights in standard floors as well. We have a rule saying 2.5 meters in housing, but a lot of now a lot of developers are, are seeing that, okay, we have to live up to daylight restrictions. Mm, okay, we need a little higher rooms. Yes, that's great. It's much better with a little bit more height. So that's actually a good example of how a building norm can change the the, the expression of architecture and the, the, yes, and the rooms. If we have balconies protruding from the facade, they will be used actively as solar shades, but also they will be shifted a lot because you have to ensure that all uh, stories have uh, enough daylight inside. Functionalities will be placed in the building mass according to the daylight demand, so we will put office retail in the deep streets and housing above, 
And I kid you not, but that's not that's seen before. I would say <laughs> that's an old knowledge. We've always done that for other reasons, but it's actually also a daylight uh, requirement today. We also uh, will use all the roof terraces, all terraces, all the roofs will be used for active uh, uh, daylight harvest, okay, or day daylight harvesting or exploitation because of the dense city. We will uh, see setback roofs, mansards, with mansards more setbacks so that the light can really enter into the streets. And we will see homes generally with large windows in, uh, facing in any direction. So, evidence-based design is, uh, demands a holistic approach to the architecture of hospitals. So, this idea is to prove the long time uh, the idea of using evidence-based design is really to prove the long-time advantages and societal values in the lifespan and running of the buildings, which justifies a higher and better built-in quality in the design and planning um, of a particularly design of hospitals. In this wheel of integrated evidence-based sustainable hospital design, all elements in the circle will help patients to recover quicker, bring down human error, give a positive experience, etc. And it'll actually shorten the healing period and bring down the hospitalization time. So that's a lot of economy. We know that it'll optimize the, the future needs for patients as well as relatives and staff. So resulting in faster healing process, shorter duration, better patient safety, far more efficient operation and lower energy consumption during the lifetime of, of this hospital. And it'll add to the building cost, yes, but uh, we'll, we'll see savings on staff satisfaction, meaning no sickness day or less sickness days, energy and operation efficiency, and shorter recovery times for the patient that will outweigh the initial cost by far. So in other words, it's cheaper for the taxpayer in the long run to implement the newest know-how today at a higher building cost. Because there's this interesting correlation, obviously, that. Uh, when the cost of a hospital, you can see here construction versus running cost. So the dark blue part is the construction cost. And the light blue part is the running cost of uh, what a hospital is costing society in its lifespan. So it's a lot of money to run the hospital for 50 years, but it only costs this much to build it. So why save on obvious ideas here when you can actually reduce the cost in the big blue one? So there's a kind of box thinking in our countries, I think it would probably be the same thing in many countries. When you're, when you're the state or when we're investing in a hospital, the state actually pays from two boxes. They've got a box for the construction and they've got another money box for the running cost. And these boxes, they don't speak very well together. This is a problem because all the knowledge we know when we do the construction is not really harvested in the running of the building. So, in other words, when the cost of a hospital is a fraction of the cost of running a hospital for its lifetime, how come we don't spend a little more of evidence-based quality to ensure that society gets the most value for our tax money? And is this not more important than one or two fellow persons' political career? Because you can see the man who uh, gave the order to decrease the budget in the blue, he's living after the hospital is finished, but he's dead before the hospital is finished running. So why is he so important? <laughs> That's my question. OK, daylight, you know, uh, optimizing humans' well-being. This is also specifically in hospitalized, uh, hospitals uh, we're talking here. It has real medical effect, as I mentioned, ultraviolet rays on the skin, psoriasis, multiple sclerosis, tuberculosis. The daylight helps maintaining a normal daily biorhythm. Because it, so it becomes a positive effect on your sleep cycle and healing time for patients will go down. It helps reducing depressions. Uh, if you place a person with depression on an east-facing uh, ward uh, you, and uh, you get the morning sun, you can decrease the, uh, the antidepressive medicine radically. So uh, daylight increases the energy level and has a positive effect on stress level and the blood pressure. And Coming over to nature, now that was daylight. When, when we talk about natureness and, and the nearness of nature and in, in integration in hospital design, there's also a lot of evidence what, how this uh, is helpful. Because the brain understands the nature better than the urban context. This is just a natural thing. And man will spontaneously seek nature in stressful situations. Lower pulse and blood pressure, less muscular torsion, 
it gives a, a, a positive uh, emotion as well. The curves here I'm showing you uh, on the left is uh, just a small uh, curve showing how uh, the impact on the blood pressure it the, for patients exposed to images of the nature versus images of the traffic. <laughs> so you can see at, at the, the graph in the middle, you have this, uh, it dips down, the blood pressure is falling radically when the, we're looking at nature rather than the top graph, which is showing how the blood pressure reacts uh, when you are looking at traffic. I'm sorry, but I know that intuitively. Uh, don't you know that intuitively? I know that. And the other image, the gray one, is showing a significant decrease in use of painkillers for patients exposed to nature versus those who are exposed to a hospital wall. We have quite a lot of patients in our hospitals who have to be in the hallway. You know, it's not a, some, we're not terribly proud of it, but they're, not all can get a room and a look at the nature. Some have to be in the hallway. And that's very bad because they eat a lot more medicine, the ones in the hallway. So. Luckily, when we have seven huge super hospitals on the way in Denmark, the government was actually standing up to some of this evidence and ruled that all the hospitals should be uh, made with um, uh, one patient rooms. So not two patients, but one patient in each room. And there is a number of advantages for that. Of course, it reduces stress from other patients. It ensures more quietness and quicker healing. So it lets, lets the patient be close to the view of the window and they can enjoy the comfort and safety of having families staying, staying overnight. And these high, with the light coming long in, but low set windows looking at the nature, these windows allow for ample daylight and seeing uh, the nature of when you're lying in your bed. So, and the ambience of the room we try, should be non-institutional and many natural materials, again, close to the body and without compromising, of course, a safe and clean environment for, for germs and the cleaners. So, really, a hotel is more uh, what, we, what, what you should look for, a kind of a home away from home. Um, I don't know if you're really sick. I think it's a, perhaps a little far-fetched, but the, it's better than doing the other thing anyway. So, two cases. That was a long introduction. Here are the two short cases. The first case I'd like to talk about is the technical faculty uh, in Odense. It's uh, an addition to the Faculty of Engineering, University of Odense. It's a public building and it's an education facility, obviously. It houses four institutes, the Institute of Material and Construction Science, the Institute of Nano Optics and, and the Environmental Science Institute and the Robotics Institute. So it's all the nerds, the technical nerds who are here. Thank God. Um, <clears throat> the design of this building needs to fulfill uh, two uh, important things. And it's focusing on using evidence of the positive effects on uh, daylight uh, on learning. But the two important things it must highlight is one, highlight and signal the innovative research environment that goes on inside. Two, it's a huge box. The building footprint is equal to a football field. And this 120 meter by 60 meter full site footprint is three stories tall. So three football fields stacked. So how to provide daylight to all rooms inside this enormous volume, turning them into a bright and welcoming and work efficient uh, spaces adequate for optimal learning. So the program stated, started out, of course, with, uh, OK, we'll have an open plan office layout. Everyone is sitting together around the periphery of the building and deep inside, and we can do blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. And this is the beauty of the user involvement. We want cell structures. We want an office each. Oh, but that will take up a lot more space. Oh, yes, but you must put some more rooms inside. So have a look how dense it is. You can see on the left. It's completely packed on all three floors. Uh, so all square meter and all uh, daylight uh, elements had to be hard ex exploited. The solution, of course, was to build this glass box, a skin of glass around it, to lead in a maximum amount of daylight inside, and then screen it off again with uh, various ways. So the volume is cut up in five individual buildings and connected with bridges. 
And the offices are organized along the perimeter with the 2% daylight factor demand. And the labs and the meeting rooms are based in the, in the center on the borrowed light uh, mandate for more temporary works. And the cuts in the envelope acts as a source of daylight, obviously, and combined with well, these canyons that are cut in. And they are combined with an expressive solar screen uh, that can uh, control the heat gain on the building. Um, the screen also, you could argue, will give character to the otherwise very simplistic and quiet box volume. So there are many bridges that are connecting uh, into the central part, which is this copper-clad centerpiece of the faculty. So and that's highlighting the shared facilities for the four uh, faculties, and it contains like, the auditoriums, the cafes, and other educational spaces but it's a lot of this, the, the common ground for all four institutes. The connections are allowing for the boundaries in the building to be more fluid. And um, <clears throat> um, it also supports this knowledge sharing that you can visually see people, oh, I, I have to talk to this guy, oh, I have to talk to this, this girl. So this cross-pollination of ideas is important in this learning, uh, learning space. So this main staircase, it really acts as a place to see and be seen, a city plaza or a town hall square of the building. And it helps also to orientate the, the user uh, of the building, so sort of has a, an efficient wayfinding. And from here, you can also observe all the activities in the labs around. So because the, the walls would be transparent dividers so that you can see from the central part of the building to the outside uh, through the building. So above these three canyons of the building, the roofs are penetrated by very large, and yes, ladies and gentlemen, here it comes, Velox skylights. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we have uh, the offices placed along the perimeter of the building, and it has a, a relatively unobstructed view, you would say. <laughs> Uh, of the nature outside. And it's adding, uh, this screen of course is adding to the user's comfort, but also the nature outside as we, as we proved earlier on. So these surfaces are highly reflective and painted, uh, so high gloss, like reflective uh, glass and, and, uh, and high gloss paint. And they're painted all white in order to support this ever traveling, uh, bouncing off of the daylight into the building and the daylight levels inside the lab rooms in the depth of the building. Oh, okay. This building screen, just one minute, because you're all architects, or some of you are, and would be perhaps interested in that. It's consisting of a six centimeter thick CRC prefabricated perforated panel in seven different patterns that can be combined. And these different circular diameters, they have been optimized to act as a solar screen and, and uh, glare protection, and it reduces 50% of the sunlight. So the faculty here, I would conclude, is an example of a sustainable innovative science building, and it's based on findings and evidence of of which design enablers should be used to obtain the maximal well-being in a perfect learning environment to support this interaction and networking. I have very little time, uh, but I have a couple of pictures here on the MERS Tower, I'm sorry. The MERS Tower is a recently inaugurated research facility forming part of the Faculty of Medicine in the University of Copenhagen, 42,000 square meters of education and state-of-the-art research spaces. The client is the Danish state, the users are the medical students and medical researchers, and the tower was partly paid for by the Pride Foundation, the MERSC Foundation. And the tower raises above uh, a base of lower buildings spreading out onto the side like petals of a flower. And these are containing, oh, sorry, you can see it here. Main reception, service facilities, canteen, auditorium, breakout spaces, etc. And it's public, publicly accessible, which is uh, contrary, contrary to the public buildings of the US. You, you explained, James, uh, that it was like uh, gated. But here, we, they are trying to make it very public. So. Uh, the new building is raising 72 meters in 16 stories of mixed laboratories and office spaces. The facade consists of vertical copper-clad lamellas spanning over a glass facade. And this facade has been constructed from fixed and movable shutters that track the sun as it moves with sensor-driven. Some of the, these lamellas are movable in the lateral sense, so permitting the facade to close in direct sunlight. 
And the shutters keep out much of the solar gain, and the effects of the vertical shutters in the rounded corners of the building is also reducing the wind turbulence and downdraft at the foot of the tower. And um, yes, just a little word on the landscape, and then I'll close off. Uh, this landscape is designed by SLA architect, landscape architects that we work closely with. And the idea is to host different activities for play and, react and uh, recreation. And it's, a, it's, it's planted heavily with a forestry ambience to add a new park-like urban space to the city. And a bicycle path, which you can probably uh, reckon, is uh, zigzagging across the building complex that is going to connect the building from east to west. And uh, there's a couple of uh, enablers that they were going for, tactility, diversity, peacefulness, and variation to uh, the indicator, as indicators for the design of the landscape. And it's acting as a stimulant for well-being and for stress reduction and enhancing concentration when used in the perimeter of the building. And it also strengthens the inside-out relation and invites you to be, you know, be further health-bringing recreation. So... Um, we also know, of course, that trees are adding to cleaner air quality, absorption of NOx gases, uh, uh, wind reduction, the increasing humidity and the cooling down of the city. So it's all very well with trees. The building is integrated into the surroundings of the local context, this genius Lochi. So trying to um, talk a little bit with the little church near it, the proportions of that church is respected and the materiality also. Oh, the guys are going up, standing up now. <laughs> The building is brown now and matches the church, and later it will become green and match the church tower. Oh, so, yes, I talked about the bicycle track, you know that. So let me conclude now. One image and then conclusion. The tower has three huge, uh, three or four stories of atriums above each other, stacked uh, on top of each other in the 17 stories. And they act as common rooms of, uh, in a hierarchy of breakout spaces for the researchers. And they're made in order to link the institutes together vertically and give inspiration to the, this cross-pollination of ideas and thoughts between the researchers. And the view and the daylight itself in the tower atriums, they're both attracting the, the, sci the researchers, the users, into an inspiring breakout space, inviting them to exchange their thoughts. In conclusion, so my point is, we, we should say that modernity and industrialization has untaught us how to live in harmony with the planet, nature, and our own nature-given resourcefulness, as well as even understanding what is good for us and what makes us feel happy. So the examples here from the hospitals and the two universities, this shows how architectural knowledge have been put into use. This knowledge, of course, is based on both professional know-how on aesthetics, functionality, technique, behavioral patterns, also based on hard scientific evidence, and frankly, quite a lot of it is based on intuition and common sense. And for many years as an architect, I've been fighting and discussing with clients and contractors how to raise the construction budget, arguing on my soft intuition for what I know is good for the building and the people inside it in the lifespan of the building. Many of you will know exactly what I'm talking about here. So when arguing for an evidence-based design, science comes to the architect's aid by giving scientific proof to what we all know as self-evident truths of what makes humans thrive. We know it with our bodies, we know it with our hearts, but it helps us to design based on documentation and it helps us argue for a connection between construction costs and running costs in public buildings, the buildings that belong to all of us. So we're getting more and more scientific proof of what we have, perhaps always known intuitively, to be attractive for the well-being of people. New knowledge that, perhaps combined with modern technology and digitalization, or it should, should also challenge this rather standardized comfort norms that we see in our building regulations to cater for individual needs. Because we are different in our behavior, but we also have a lot of biology in common. For example, how the brain reacts positively to nature sounds, such as the chaotic sounds of a burning fire, running water, the ocean waves, the sound of birds, and laughing children. And remember how we instinctively seek a spot in the sun or a spot in the shade and go for a swim in the sea or a walk in the woods. So these are perhaps the true added values 
we should be looking f to el elevate to future sustainability goals. And we are getting more and more science to back it up. In other words, we have to relearn how to design with and by nature's common sense. As architects, we have an obligation to look at ideal long-term effects for the uses when creating tomorrow's buildings and cities. For instance, looking at what elements and enablers in architecture keeps us healthy for ethic reasons and for economical reasons. We will achieve this by arguing for intuition, common sense, backed up by hard evidence from new research and new technologies. These future healthy, intelligent and empathetic buildings will physically and mentally and thereby ultimately have an impact on people's happiness. And with this, I thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lonnie. Thank you. It was very inspiring. <laughs> Thanks. Would, you, would you please sit here oh, or yeah. on this one no, now that you have taken all the leaves <laughs> back? Looking out the window. And I will call also James uh, to be here. We still have a few minutes. Oh. For